course of Order. the debate. Senator Steele, John, debate will resume. Questions without notice. Oh, Senator Corbyn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, I table for the information of the Senator Revised Ministry list. Uh, I seek leave to have the document incorporated uh, into Hansard and make a short statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. I advise the Senate that the updated uh, ministry list reflects the updated representation arrangements for the regional services, decentralisation and local government portfolio to Senator uh, Canavan. Thank you. Uh, Mr Senator President, Cormann. I also seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Uh, Mr President, I advise the Senate that Senator Birmingham will be absent from question time today. Monday, 9 September 2019, due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Birmingham's absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment and the Assistant Trade and Investment Minister. Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Education and Senator Canavan will represent the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction and the Minister for the Environment. Thank you. Order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a statement relating to shadow ministerial arrangements. Leave is granted. Senator Wong. I, I thank the Senate. I advise that the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Albanese, has appointed Senator Pratt as Shadow Assistant Minister for Employment Services, in addition to her responsibilities as Shadow Assistant Minister for Manufacturing. I congratulate her on this appointment and I seek leave to table the revised shadow ministry list and to have it incorporated into Hansa. Leave is granted. We'll move to questions. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Coalition has now been in office for more than six years. Can the Minister, can the minister confirm that under Mr Morrison and Mr Frydenberg, Australia is experiencing the slowest rate of annual economic growth since the global financial crisis. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, what I can confirm for Senator Wong is that the Australian economy continues to grow. We are into our 28th year of continuous growth, where other major trading economies around the world, like Germany and the United Kingdom, went backwards uh, in the June quarter. We continue to grow. And you know what else I can confirm for Senator Wong? That if there had been a change of government in May, right now the economy would be weaker on the back of $397 billion in higher taxes from the Labor Party. Order, Senator Cormann. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. You've been in for six years. Can you confirm slowest economic growth since the GFC? Senator Wong, you've reminded the minister of the question. He was being directly relevant, even if the last few words may have been a slight stray. Um, I call the minister to continue the answer. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I, I confirm again. I confirm again that the Australian economy Order. is in a stronger Order. position as a result of our plan to build a stronger, more resilient, more successful economy than what would have been the case under the alternative. Order. And I know that in the Labor Party they're having this massive debate whether they can blame it all on Mr. Shorten or whether they actually have to reflect on what socialist Order. policies they took Senator to the last election. Foreman. Senator Wong. On the point of order. I know he doesn't want to take responsibility, Mr. President, but the question he is the finance minister. The question goes to the slow economic growth over which he has presided. Um, Who was leader of the opposition last term is not relevant to the question asked. I was having trouble between all the screaming hearing Senator Cormann in that part of the answer. Um, it, is, it is in order and directly relevant to discuss the matter of economic growth as part of that question, Senator Wong. I call the minister to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. This question goes directly around the, uh, to the alternative policy choices, the alternative economic policy choices order, and the impact on order. economic Senator growth. Senator Cormann, I'll, let, I'll take Senator Wong on this point of order. Senator Wong. Mr President, I seek your ruling on how it is possible that a question which is, and I repeat, can the minister confirm that under Mr Morrison and Mr Frydenberg, Australia is experiencing the closest rate of slowest rate of annual economic growth since the GFC can possibly have, as, it, as directly relevant, alternative policies of the um, opposition. I, how is that possibly relevant? So, I, uh, on the on the on, 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 I'll just wait till this so I can talk. Um, on the point of order. The minister is entitled to talk about economic growth. In my view, that is directly relevant to the question. However, any material that is additional to a specific answer must also be directly relevant to the question. So, to that extent, um, uh, Minister, um, there is a limitation. The question was quite specific, 
and the answer, but any any answer, Senator Wong, please, any answer that covers the material about economic growth, in my view, is directly relevant. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I cannot possibly answer a question about the economic growth in Australia without actually comparing the two alternative policy agendas that were put forward to the Australian people. On the our agenda of lower taxes, pro-growth, pro-opportunity, pro-aspiration, the economy continues to grow. Under the alternative, that the economy would have been weaker and Australians would have been poorer. And in Australia, compared to other countries around the world, we actually do continue to grow. And the, as the Reserve Bank Governor also said, uh, growth is expected to strengthen into the future. Have you looked at our employment growth? More than twice the uh, growth rate across the OECD uh, economies. More than twice the growth rate in employment uh, uh, compared to the OECD average. But of course, I mean the Labor Party. The Labor Party, uh, of course, doesn't want to talk about the impact of their policies compared to ours. Com compared to ours, because they know they are deeply embarrassed about the fact that the Australian people have rejected their socialist order, agenda. Order. Time for the answers expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. In Mr. Morrison's last budget as Treasurer, the government forecast the economy would grow by three per cent in 2018-19. Can the minister confirm the Morrison government has fallen well short of its own economic growth targets? Again. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Actually, I refer, to, uh, shadow, I, I refer Senator Wong uh, to the most recent budget, where the growth uh, forecast for 2018-19 was two and a quarter percent, and, in, and that is in real, on average, on, on average through the year terms. The actual growth rate in real terms is 1.9, which is slightly below what was anticipated because some of the downside risks, some of the downside risks which we pointed out, pointed to in the, in the budget, have eventuated. But let me also tell you that nominal growth is actually higher than we anticipated at budget time. We forecast nominal growth of 5% uh, at budget time for 2018-19, and we have uh, recorded 5.3% uh, nominal growth. So nominal growth is slightly higher. Uh, real growth has come in slightly lower. But let me tell you, we're not making any secrets about the fact that the Australian economy is facing global economic headwinds. We're not making any secrets about the fact that we're dealing uh, with downside risks in the uh, domestic economy from floods and drought uh, and so on. But we are dealing with it, and Order. our policy Senator agenda Coleman, makes Australia stronger the compared expired. to the alternative. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Under the strong and stable leadership of three Prime Ministers, three Deputy Prime Ministers, three Treasurers and following 16 failed energy policies, Australians are experiencing stagnant wages. Oh, and one finance minister, he is the constant in this poor economic record. Stagnant wages, record household debt, surging energy prices, increasing rental and mortgage stress and declining living standards. Isn't it clear after six years of coalition government with no plan for the economy, Australians are working harder Order. and going Senator backwards? Cormann. Senator Thank Cormann. you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we took uh, our plan to build a stronger economy to the last election and uh, the Australian people endorsed it. And let me also just correct. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition again. She's wrong when she talks about stagnant wages. Wages are actually growing above inflation. The most recent wages data, 2.3 per cent wages growth compared to 1.6 per cent uh, CPI. Now, that is, that is not stagnant uh, wages. That is wages growing above inflation. Yes, we would like wages to grow more strongly, and that will happen on the back of uh, our agenda to continue to build a stronger, more successful economy. If we want businesses to be able to uh, pay higher wages, uh, we need to ensure that they've got better opportunities to be successful. That is precisely what our government is doing uh, as the uh, unemployment rate uh, continues to come down. I mean, it was headed for six and a quarter percent and beyond when we came into government. I mean, you know, the then shadow treasurer was actually saying the test would be whether we could keep it below six and a quarter percent. It's down to 5.2 percent. Uh, we will continue to work to get it lower, but the Australian Order, people know Senator that Coleman. your agenda would have left them. Senator McGrath. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Will the Minister update the Senate on how the government is supporting those Australians affected by bushfires across Queensland, including in my home district of the Southern Downs and Northern New South Wales? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator McGrath uh, for that question. Uh, Southern Queensland and North East New South Wales have experienced unprecedented fires since Friday. Uh, it is only September and every indication is that a hot, uh, dry summer is ahead. Uh, there are over 100 fires burning across Queensland and New South Wales, 51 active fires in New South Wales. However, those fires 
that were of great concern over Friday and Saturday, the fires at uh, Tenterfield in New South Wales and at Stanthorpe, uh, Applethorpe and Saraba in Queensland, no longer threaten lives and property. However, the forecast of dry and windy conditions until Tuesday and no sign of rain means the fire situation remains volatile. The fire danger ratings are very high for northeast New South Wales and southeast Queensland. Fortunately, uh, no lives were lost, uh, though a New South Wales Rural Fire Service volunteer firefighter uh, was uh, sadly seriously injured while fighting a fire near Tenterfield. Our thoughts are with the volunteer and their family. In terms of property, five houses were destroyed, uh, another five damaged, and 25 non-residential structures have been destroyed in the New South Wales fires. In Queensland, 52 houses were damaged, including 15 houses that were completely destroyed. Fire has also destroyed historic uh, Binabura Lodge uh, in the Gold Coast hinterland, which is part of uh, the Australian World Heritage listed Eastern Rhine Forest Reserves. I can report that the Australian Defence Force is providing uh, support to firefighters at uh, Kokoda Barracks, uh, uh, Kamungra. In New South Wales and Queensland, we are also providing disaster recovery assistance. In New South Wales, the assistance is being provided under the jointly funded Commonwealth State Disaster Recovery funding arrangements. It is available for the local government areas of Armidale, uh, Clarence uh, Valley, uh, Glen Innes, Inverell, uh, Tenterfield, Urala and Walcha. Anyone in need of assistance should contact the New South Wales Government Disaster Welfare Assistance Line on 1800 Likewise in Queensland, uh, DRFI assistance is available in the local government areas of Scenic Rim and Southern Downs. The Queensland Government Community Recovery Hotline uh, is 1800 173 349. I want to thank, on behalf of uh, the government and I'm sure the entire Senate, uh, our emergency services and our career and volunteer personnel for all the work they have done in recent days. Uh, you have our gratitude, respect and deep thanks. The best thing anyone can do in these areas and others uh, affected by fires in coming months is to plan to stay aware of your surroundings and follow the advice from local emergency management authorities. The buildings can be rebuilt, vegetation can regrow, but people can't be replaced. It's uh, beholden on all of us to take the necessary precautions and care over the months ahead. Senator Watt. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Uh, the opposition joins with the government in expressing our deep concern for residents affected by the serious bushfires that are burning across Queensland and northern New South Wales. As of last night, there were 51 active fires in New South Wales and 69 in Queensland. It is of concern that so many bushfires of this severity are occurring so early in the year, and this should prompt further thought by all in this place. Many properties have been destroyed and damaged, including the heritage-listed Binnaburra Lodge in the Gold Coast hinterland. The opposition has been in contact with Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and state and federal emergency services ministers to offer support and will continue to monitor the situation very closely. We commend the efforts of fire and emergency service personnel and the many volunteers who have assisted in these dangerous conditions. We also commend residents of bushfire-affected regions for their cooperation with authorities. We join our state and federal counterparts in encouraging all residents to follow the directions of authorities from here on. We express our sincere sympathies to those who have lost their properties and will do what we can to support recovery efforts. We urge state and federal governments to take a compassionate approach towards those affected as recovery gets underway. <coughs> Senator Gallagher. Oh, thank you. Mr. oh sorry, Senator Dinatale, I didn't see you rise. I make a short statement. Leave is granted. Senator Dinatale. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to join with the government and the opposition indeed in thanking the incredible effort of emergency services workers who are putting their lives on the line right now in uh, defending property and ensuring that uh, Australian lives are not put at risk. Uh, we also extend our deepest sympathies, our thoughts, with the many uh, Australians who have lost their homes, uh, their property, uh, animals, and have experienced great trauma as a result of these, in the words of the Leader of the Senate, unprecedented fires. Uh, but the Australian Greens don't just offer our thanks. We acknowledge that these fires will only continue to get more frequent, more severe, more intense and put more lives at risk. Uh, the, the emergency services workers have said unequivocally that it is absolutely critical 
that we deal with human-induced climate change. If we are not going to do that, we put their lives at risk and we put the lives of more Australians at risk. It is absolutely critical that we acknowledge we are in a climate emergency, that ministers who fail to act on climate change are putting the lives of Australians at risk, that we must do everything we can to transition our economy away from polluting fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas into renewable energies to de decrease pollution and to ensure that our climate crisis, which is contributing to these fires, is dealt with in a way that is consistent with the science, with the evidence, with what emergency service workers are demanding of us, with what doctors are demanding of us and which, with what the science is demanding of all of us. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The 2019 Hilda survey revealed that since the coalition was elected in 2013, median household incomes in Australia have gone backwards, declining from $80,208 in 2013 to $80,095 in 2017. Can the minister explain why? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. What I can explain is that uh, the Australian economy has faced uh, a number of global economic headwinds that everybody ah. understands other than the Labor Party. I mean, we are an open trading economy, and if you look at what's happening in economies around the world, our, our economy continues to grow, continues to generate more jobs, 1.4 million new jobs under our government, in particular, highest workforce participation on record, equal highest workforce participation uh, among women, uh, 100,000 uh, new jobs uh, uh, for, for, for young people in uh, you know, a very short time, welfare dependency as a share of the working age population is at its lowest in 30 years, a triple I credit rating which has been reaffirmed by the three leading rating agencies, uh, one of only 10 countries. And I mean, all of these arguments that uh, the Labor Party is now throwing at us, they're all arguments that the Labor Party has been putting to us in the lead up to the last election. And the Australian people judged, and the Australian people judged that there was better opportunity for them to get ahead under our policies than under the alternative. Uh, so, I mean, the Labor Party can try and run this argument uh, as, as long as they want. The truth is, yes, we're facing challenges. Yes, our government has a plan to ensure we are as resilient in the best possible position possible to deal with those challenges and where other economies are going backwards. Our economy continues to grow, continues to create better opportunity for families to get ahead. You always got to look at what the order. alternative scenario Senator would have Coleman. been. Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Thank you. And I, I did wait for some time, Mr President, but um, on relevance. Uh, the question was around the Hilda survey, and we drew on some um, statistics from that. And the minister has not gone close to even attempting to answer that question. We can understand why, but um, Thank you. certainly on relevance, Senator it should Gallagher. be drawn to the question. On the, on the question. point of order, I remind ministers that answers must be directly relevant. However, I cannot instruct them how to answer a question. Um, I do believe a minister talking about economic issues and the government's record in relation to this question would be directly relevant. I call the minister to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, household income is higher under our government than it would have been oh. under the alternative. Oh. Household income, and you can laugh, you can laugh about that. But for starters, for starters, you went to the last election with $387 billion in higher taxes. Over the last three months, when since 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 the second week of July. The tax office has put $15.1 billion back into the pockets of hardworking Australians. You know why? Because of our plan to provide income tax relief for hardworking Australians, which the Labor Party fought every step of the way right until the end. There's $15.1 billion uh, in tax cuts currently stimulating the economy that wouldn't have been there if it Order. wasn't for us. Senator Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, can the minister confirm that ho household incomes per capita haven't grown in the six years since the Liberals came to office? Shame. Yes, Sen Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me uh, say it again. Uh, incomes are higher than they would have been uh, if there hadn't been a change of government back in 2013. That is because employment growth was low under Labor, the economy was weakening under Labor, the budget position was rapidly deteriorating under Labor, and of course, and of course we have put our country on a stronger, more resilient, more resilient uh, position and trajectory for the future. In order. Incidentally, income— Senator, Senator, Coleman on, um, Senator Wong on a point of order. He may be getting to household income per capita. Senator, I'll sit down. Senator Thank, you. Thank you very much. 
in, in very small font because it's very important detailed information. Uh, according to the latest ABS data, uh, it shows that income inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient decreased from 0 0.333 uh, in 2013 14 to uh, 0 0.328 in 2017 18. Um, these findings are consistent with the latest data from the 2019 Hilda, which shows that while order. the Gini coefficient. Senator, Cormann, um, Senator Wong, on a point uh, of order. Having a fin Liberal Finance Minister talk, the Minister talk about the Gini coefficient is very interesting, but actually the question was household incomes per capita not having grown in six years since this, pers this minister became Finance Minister. Um, I remind ministers that. While I cannot instruct them how to answer questions, when specific, very specific questions are asked, one must tightly remain directly relevant to them. Uh, on this basis, I think the minister is being directly relevant, dealing with the record or ec the economic statistics and record of the government. Senator Cormann. Uh, 1.4 million more Australians in jobs. Uh, of course, wages continue to grow above inflation, and $15.1 billion worth of tax cuts putting more increasing effective wages growth as a result of our government. Order, billion Senator dollars Cormann. Uh, Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr President. Australians are working harder but going backwards, experiencing stagnant wages, record household debt, surging energy prices, increasing rental and mortgage stress <laughs> and declining living standards. When will the Morrison government finally take action to turn the floundering economy around? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Well, let, let me just say again: the economy is stronger, much stronger than it would have been uh, if the Labor Party had been in government over the last six years. Uh, then, under, under our government, under our government, the economy has continued to grow. 1.4 million more Australians in jobs. Uh, record, uh, record participation rate, uh, equal record participation rate for women, and, and of course wages continue to grow above inflation. And you know what, what the Australian people understand, but what the Labor Party clearly doesn't understand, is that our economic policy agenda pro offers the opportunity for even better opportunity into the future, for stronger growth into the future. They made a judgment. They made a judgment that Labor's high-taxing agenda, anti-business, politics, uh, politics of envy, class warfare agenda would have made the country and the economy weaker and would have made all Australians poorer. That is why they voted for us, and it's time that the Labor Party reassesses uh, its socialist agenda, as even Mr. Butler uh, is suggesting. Even Mr. Butler is suggesting Order. that they have a look at what Senator what, what, what Coleman, wrong. time for the answer has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Water, Resources, Drought, Rural Finance, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator Mackenzie. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the current situation of the bushfires across northern New South Wales and Queensland? Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Senator Davey. And I'm sure all of our thoughts are with those communities who have been impacted by the bushfires in New South Wales and Queensland, communities who are also struggling uh, with the drought. I would also like to uh, commend the efforts of our first responders who are working day and night to keep these communities safe, many who are volunteers. The bushfires burning in southern Queensland and northeast New South Wales remain active and include an emerging situation at Shark Creek near Yamba. The forecast of dry and windy conditions until Tuesday, with no sign of rain, means the fire situation will remain volatile. I urge everyone to stay aware of their surroundings and follow advice from local emergency management authorities. The full impact of the fires are still being assessed. Uh, the impacts that have been confirmed so far include, in Queensland, 17 homes that have been lost in Stanthorpe. Fire has also been, has destroyed historic Binnaburra Lodge in the Gold Coast hinterland. It's part of the Australia World Heritage listed Eastern Rainforest Reserves. In New South Wales, one home has been destroyed, another five damaged and 15 other structures have been destroyed. Sadly, a New South Wales rural fire service volunteer firefighter was seriously injured while fighting a fire near Tenterfield on Friday afternoon. And our thoughts and prayers are with the injured firefighter and his loved ones. The Australian government is in regular contact with the affected jurisdictions and is positioned to provide assistance when required. On Friday, the 6th of September, the Director General of Emergency Management Australia approved the activation and COM DIS plan in relation to bushfires burning in southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales, which sees our defence force on the ground ready to assist in the recovery phase of the fires. Senator Davey. Can the minister please update the Senate on what actions the federal government, in conjunction with both the New South Wales and Queensland governments, 
is taking to ensure the safety and support of our bushfire affected communities. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Disaster recovery assistance is being provided under the jointly funded Commonwealth State Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements. The DRFA assistance is available in the local government areas of Armidale, Clarence Valley, Glen Innes, Inverell, Tenterfield, Urala and Walker in New South Wales, the scenic rim and southern downs in Queensland. It is important to note that the bushfire situation in both Queensland and New South Wales is considered active and further assistance may be made available once the fires are controlled. The range of assistance available in New South Wales includes personal hardship and distress assistance for individuals and families, support for affected local councils and state agencies to help with operational responses and restoring damage to central public assets, concessional interest rate loans for small businesses, primary producers and non-for-profit organisations, freight subsidies for primary producers and grants for eligible non-profit organisations. The assistance is administered by the New South Wales Government and anyone needing assistance should contact the New South Wales Government Disaster Welfare Order. Assistant Line on 1800 018 Senator Davey, final supplementary question. Um, and what further measures or assistance is the federal government taking uh, to assist New South Wales and Queensland communities affected by this unprecedented and devastating bushfire event? Senator McKenzie. The Australian government annually invests around $15 million in aerial firefighting. Firebombing aircraft have been in action against these fires. Our national aerial firefighting arrangements are ensuring the best possible aerial firefighting equipment is available to protect Australians. In addition, the Australian Defence Force is assisting under last fr Friday's activation of ComDis plan, which provides non-cash disaster assistance with the provision of accommodation, transport and sustenance for about 56 firefighters from New South Wales and the ACT. I also encourage all Australians to ensure they have in place their bushfire survival plan. This has been the driest year since 1970. This is especially the case over the southern half of the country, which has experienced the driest January to July on record. The east coast of Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania, as well as parts of southern Western Australia and South Australia, face above normal fire potential. The bomb has advised that this spring and summer is going to be unprecedentedly dry, as seen by this extremely early start to the bushfire season. We need to ensure Order. Senator McKenzie, time for the answers expired. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator McKenzie. Senator, this morning on Radio National, the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Minister Little Proud, was asked whether human induced climate change was contributing to the unprecedented fires tearing apart southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. And he said that it was, I quote, irrelevant. Minister, do you agree with the 23 emergency service chiefs from all states and territories with over 600 years of collective experience putting their lives on the line who have pleaded with your government to deal with the escalating human-induced climate crisis? Or do you agree with Minister Littleproud, who has dismissed their concerns as irrelevant? Minister representing the Minister for um, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. What I won't be doing, Senator Di Natale, is politicising bushfires, which right now are affecting landholders, homes, uh, environmental assets, and farmers in affected communities in Queensland and North East New South Wales. I will not do that while our state governments and us as a federal entity are dealing with the fallout that is occurring right now. While there's annual weather variability, and I've been very um, upfront in this chamber, as has Minister Littleproud, about the fact that the climate is changing. There is variability around the climate, and that is why our government has been taking strong action on climate change with our climate emergency fund, with our climate solutions package, where farmers, where small business people will be able to apply uh, to us with projects that will reduce emissions in the real term. That's actual practical, effectual policy responses to climate change. And the fact you don't like to think that we may have a solution on the table that will assist reducing emissions in this country from farmers in these affected regions, from our food manufacturers and our small businesses. But the fact is, 
We have that on the table, and so they will be able to apply and for technological responses that will assist their businesses to reduce their emissions and therefore assist us as a nation to meet our Paris targets, uh, 26 to 28 per cent on the 2005, which, again, you might not like to hear it, but we are actually, as a nation, going to solve that problem. We're going to meet those targets where many, many nations uh, across the world are not even coming close, not haven't even signed up to the Paris Agreement. So rather than ripping us down, let's work together to reduce emissions and meet Order. our Paris Agreement. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, when will you acknowledge that your government's stubborn inaction on reducing pollution and shameless spruiking of more coal, oil and gas projects means that you are putting at risk the lives of emergency services workers, people who live in bushfire-prone communities, the loss of property, the terminal extinction of Australian species. When will you acknowledge that your inaction on climate change is responsible for putting the lives of Australians at risk? Or Senator McKenzie. All very dramatic, Senator Di Natale. All very dramatic. I, I, you know, I fundamentally reject your, the premise of your question. I've outlined what, just one of the measures that our government has on the table to address climate change and the reduction of emissions across our economy. You mightn't like it. It might not be your solution, but the reality is it will reduce emissions and it will assist with practical measures our farmers and our small businesses to actually use technology to reduce emissions. But I'm very happy to go through other measures. So uh, we've funded improved seasonal forecasting tools to inform decision making on farm so that our primary producers can actually uh, make changes to how they produce our food that are much more um, emission sensitive. Tax incentive, including depreciation arrangements to encourage on farm investment in preparedness for these sort of issues. Establishing and topping up the now $1 billion national water infrastructure development fund, investing Order. over a billion Senator dollars McKenzie, in land time care. for the answers expired. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you've talked a lot about climate variability. I want to ask you a simple question. Do you accept that climate change, human-induced, is making bushfires worse and therefore puts at risk the lives of ordinary Australians? Senator McKenzie. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Di Natale, our government's made very clear that we take climate change seriously. We've got a suite of policy options on the table to practically assist our economy, our individuals and our businesses adapt their practices and uh, their way of life to ensure that order. we Senator reduce— McKenzie. Senator Di Natale, on a point of Mr. order. Mr President, I deliberately made that a very, very narrow question. I asked the minister whether she accepted that human-induced climate change would make bushfires worse and therefore put more Australians at risk. Very straightforward question, and she's refused to answer the substance of that question. Senator Di Natale, you've reminded the minister of the question. It is not for me in the chair to direct the minister how to answer a question. That is for everyone else to judge. As long as the minister is being directly relevant to it, and with the minister's answer, I do consider her being directly relevant. Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, you know, Senator Di Natale. Uh, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to ensure that this stereotypical perspective of the National Party continues. And the reality is we're part of a government that is actually addressing climate change, has practical measures on the table uh, across our budget uh, last year to actually address this. Now, order, you might Senator McKenzie. Senator Di Natale on a point of order. I know the minister is steadfastly refusing to answer the question because she doesn't want to put on the table her position on whether she believes that humans Se are Senator responsible Natale, for climate what is change. Your, what Very is your straightforward point of order? question, Senator minister. Di Natale. Point of, point of order on relevance. Okay, point then, of order then, on relevance. Then I ask Answer Senators, the question, Minister. Senator Di Natale, that was not a point of order. Um, it's not an opportunity to follow up a question. I gave you the opportunity to remind the minister of the, of the question you asked, but I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, you know, again, we have strong measures to address climate change. You know, the reality is we've got to make sure we deal with the Order. impacts of Time climate change, such as has expired. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. 
The Reserve Bank Governor, Dr Lowe, has called for an increase in infrastructure investment seven times in the four months since the election. Why has the government ignored the repeated warnings of the independent governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, so, Senator Cormann. So, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, let me just make the first point, and that is that under our government we are increasing infrastructure investment. I mean, the information that is in front of the uh, Governor of the Reserve Bank is the information that was in front of us as we were putting our budget together, and we have put a $100 billion infrastructure investment pipeline forward, which is a significant boost from the $75 billion pipeline uh, the year before. And uh, I would also refer you to comments that the Governor of the Reserve Bank has made repeatedly now over the last two months, because you're selectively quoting from him. Uh, he has made very clear that his expectation is that, the, that economic growth will strengthen uh, moving forward on the back of lower interest rates, on the back of our income tax cuts, uh, on, on the back of uh, continued high uh, infrastructure investment, uh, including and in particular from the federal government, on the back of a pickup in the resources sector, and on the back of a stabilisation uh, in our uh, housing market, in particular in uh, Sydney and Melbourne. So, I mean, let me just say that the uh, um, proposition that somehow there is a difference uh, in direction between monetary policy and fiscal policy is wrong. Uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy are absolutely heading in the same direction, uh, and we are dealing with, global, with serious global economic headwinds. We have a plan. We are working through that plan. It's a plan that was endorsed by the Australian people at an election only a few months ago. Uh, they, uh, fun they fundamentally rejected the alternative plan, and even the member for Port Adelaide, uh, who is hardly known as a, as a right-wing free marketeer, uh, is now saying that the Labour Party may have gone too far with its socialist agenda. Even Mr. Mr. Butler now is concerned about the fact uh, that Labor might have gone too far with its socialist economic policy agenda. Uh, he is uh, very concerned about the fact that former Treasurer, National President of the Labor Party, wants to protect Labor's socialist economic agenda when the Australian people know that it would have made our economy weaker and would have made all Australians poorer. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr Lowe has made clear that the Reserve Bank of Australia cannot do all the heavy lifting with monetary policy alone, telling the House Economics Committee, and I quote, one option is for fiscal support, including through spending on infrastructure. Can the minister confirm the government is continuing to ignore the advice of the governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, we 100 per cent agree that uh, monetary uh, policy cannot do the heavy lifting on its own. We absolutely agree, which is why uh, we put forward a plan uh, to build a stronger economy in our budget, uh, which is, of course, designed to deal with all of the uh, challenges that we're facing in terms of global economic uh, headwinds and in terms of domestic uh, downside risks. Uh, downside risk in the domestic economy. That is precisely what we're doing. Uh, we are lowering income taxes. We've uh, legislated more than $300 billion worth of income tax relief. Uh, we have an ambitious infrastructure investment program. We boosted that from $75 billion to $100 billion in terms of the infrastructure investment pipeline over the next decade. We have an ambitious free trade agenda to ensure that our exporting businesses get better access to overseas markets to sell Australian products and services. We've got an ambitious uh, agenda, of course, uh, to uh, to uh, reduce the cost of doing business uh, through deregulation. We've got an ambitious agenda to uh, bring down the cost of uh, energy moving forward uh, in order to make uh, our economy more competitive uh, uh, internationally. Senator Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary. Thank you. Australians are working harder and going backwards. When will the government finally heed the warnings of the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia and take action to stimulate the Australian economy? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The Australian economy continues to grow. Uh, we are into our 28th year of continuous growth, unprecedented among any uh, developed economy around the world, unprecedented. We're one of just 10 uh, AAA-rated economies. And, you know, I'm surprised that uh, uh, Senator Kitchen would ask me this question because I'm sure she would share my concern that there are some in the Labor Party who want to blame the entire loss at the last election on Mr Shorten. They want to blame the entire loss at the last election of Mr Shorten, when what is actually to blame uh, was their anti-business, higher taxes, socialist, politics of envy agenda, which all Australia, which a majority of Australians understood order. would have Senator harmed Coleman, the economy. On, Senator Wong has risen on a point of order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. No, I'm objecting to the fact he wants to talk about the Labor Party and not the Governor of the Reserve Bank. And, uh, and if you cared about Australians' jobs and incomes, you might want him to listen to the Governor of the Reserve Bank too. Uh, I remind ministers again 
that any additional information they provide must also be directly relevant. Questions, however, that are not as specific as they were earlier today do allow ministers a wider range in answering a question and being directly relevant. You have reminded the minister of the question. Senator Wong, I call the minister to continue. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Yeah, well, the thing about fiscal policy is that it always comes down to alternative options in terms of the way forward. Our approach uh, is uh, lower taxes, uh, encouraging business, uh, encouraging free enterprise, reward for effort, encouraging people to stretch themselves and get ahead, to get ahead, and, and indeed, and indeed, to ensure and to ensure that wages will grow on Order. a sustainable Senator basis. Coleman, time for the answers expired. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Six days ago, the Department of Home Affairs announced it was terminating its contract with Paladin Holdings, a company providing garrison, security and site management services on Manus Island. The department says it is satisfied with the standard of services outsourced to Paladin on the basis of reports provided by Paladin. Because only two visits were made by officers of the department to Manus in an 18-month period. My question is, Minister, $20 million a month is not chicken feed. Did the department stop officers from visiting Manus? If not, what were the reasons officers from the department did not visit Manus on a monthly basis as thought necessary by Ernst and Young? The minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hanson for her question. And Senator Hanson, in relation to the very specific details that you have requested, I will take that on notice uh, and get back to you. Uh, but in relation to the actual contracts, the PNG and Australian government have both agreed to the extension of the contracts supporting the health, welfare, and safety of transferees in Papua New Guinea, including the Paladin contract. This will provide the PNG Immigration and Citizenship Authority time to undertake an open market competitive procurement process for service delivery. Australia supports PNG's intent to assume responsibility for service delivery. The PNG Immigration and Citizenship Authority intends to undertake an open tender procurement process to identify new providers. The process will be independently managed by the PNG Immigration and Citizenship Authority without any involvement from the Australian government. And the governments of Australia and PNG will not provide ongoing commentary on future contract investigations. And Senator, as I stated, any further details I don't currently have in the brief, but I will get them for you if I can. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. <sighs> I'll be looking forward to that comment because you didn't even go anywhere near it. Um, I understand you'll get back to me. Um, actually, the media reports attributed safety concerns as the reason departmental officers were unwilling to visit Manus Island. Um, are you aware of that? And if so, what are the safety concerns? Senator Cash. Uh, Senator Hanson, unfortunately, I don't have a brief in relation to that, so I will take it on notice and revert to you. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Again, you, you're not across this, so um, hence my last question is, well, the department plans to get private company to do visa processing. How can I be confident and the Australian people that these billions will be well spent given the poor supervision of the Paladin contract? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Senator Hanson Young, for that question. And I'd actually refer you to the answer I gave in the first question, which actually did answer that. Order. Senator Ford, order on my left. Order. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the importance of the stability of the global rules based order that's behind the decision to make an Australian contribution to the international maritime security construct in the Middle East region? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank uh, the Honourable Senator for that most important question. So thank you. Uh, the government has been deeply concerned about security incidents involving shipping in the Middle East in recent months. This destabilising behaviour does threaten Australian interests in the region. And like many countries, Australia relies on the passage of ships through the Straits of Hormuz for a substantial proportion of our energy supplies. In fact, 40 per cent of fuel used in Australia transits through the Straits of Hormuz. 
freedom of navigation through international waters, whether in the Middle East or in our more immediate region, is a fundamental right of all states under international law. It is in Australia's interest to work with international partners to uphold these fundamental rights. That is why the government has reaffirmed its long-standing commitment to safe passage and also freedom of navigation by announcing that Australia will contribute to the international maritime security construct. This commitment comes after very careful consideration of Australia's national interest and also comes after close co consultation with our allies and partners. And also, I thank the opposition, uh, Senator Wong and also Richard Miles, for their constructive engagement in this process. Australia's contribution to this international effort has three main objectives. The first being the preservation of the rules-based order. Secondly, upholding freedom of navigation for the flow of commercial vessels through international waters. And thirdly, to de-escalate tensions in the Middle East. Australia's contribution will be modest, it will be meaningful and it is strictly time limited. And it includes three elements. The first element is the deployment of a P-8 Poseidon Maritime Surveillance Aircraft to the Middle East, which will be deployed for one month prior to the end of this year. The second is a frigate, HMAS Toowoomba, which will be deployed in January 2020 for a period of six months. And I can confirm that a small number of ADF uh, personnel Order. have now been Senator detached Reynolds. to the headquarters. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Minister, are there any further details you can share with the Senate about Australia's Defence Force contribution? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, as I was saying, there's three parts to our contribution, and our forward deployment has now uh, gone to the Middle East, to the IMSC headquarters, to do some more planning for this uh, activity. But Australia's contribution to ease tensions in the Gulf builds on our long standing contribution to the Middle East maritime security. In fact, Mr. President, we've had a near continuous maritime presence in the Middle East since the 1990s. And those opposite might yawn uh, at this. But I've got to say, Australia's contribution and Australia's continued contribution by the Royal Australian Navy in particular is no yawning or laughing matter. We've had a near continuous maritime presence under both side, governments from both sides of this chamber in the Middle East. When the frigate HMAS Toowoomba deploys, it will be the 68th such deployment of a Navy vessel in the Middle East on similar operations. HMAS Toowoomba will support the safe passage of maritime trade, Order. and Senator it is something Reynolds. for us to be proud of, Time not to your The answer has expired. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, could the minister provide any further details about Australia's broader contribution to its security in the Middle East? Senator Reynolds. Mm. Mm. Australia is. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Australia is proud of its long-standing contributions to security in the Middle East, and despite the rather puerile interjections from those opposite and their yawning and their comments, our service and our support order. is nothing. Senator Reynolds, is Senator, nothing. Order. Senator Reynolds, Senator Wong on a point of order. Order on my left. Senator Wong is on her feet. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I would invite the minister to recall the bipartisanship on these issues, and perhaps differentiate between people's views about her delivery and the content. Senator Reynolds, continue. Senator Wong, that is probably the most pathetic and disgraceful and disgraceful. Honestly, I hardly even know where to start. Defending those opposite, defending order. those opposite, order. yawning and laughing Senator at the contribution Wong, of our on a point of order. Well, no one on this side devalues the contribution of Australia, Australia per service personnel. No one. And please do not demean this parliament. Yes. Please do not demean this parliament by making such an accusation. Order. Please do not. O order. So I invite order. you, Minister. I invite you, Minister. We can deal with what might or might not have been said, but I can say to you there is no one on this side of the parliament, or I suspect anywhere in this parliament, who demeans the contribution of Australia's service personnel. And you have engaged sufficiently with the Labor Party through this period, and you would know that. Order. So can we please come back to some bipartisanship Senator on this issue? Senator Canavan, you were seeking the call. All right. Can I uh, remind Senator Point? I always the Leader of the Opposition and party leaders get some discretion. Because of the subject matter, I didn't call points of order to be strictly point to orders, but I think the subject matter allowed that discretion for me. Senator Reynolds to continue. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I was uh, about to say, is currently we have over a thousand Australian men and women serving with great distinction in the Middle East. And for that, I and I know many in this chamber are very proud of. And that also, and I'm very proud to say, includes over 100 reservists who are also serving us in the Middle East at the moment. And I was greatly privileged to spend time with many of these members during my visit to the region in July. And I was greatly impressed by their strong commitment to their mission and also the respect on which they were held by the people that they serve with and those that they are working for. And it is something that we all should be very proud of, not only their service, but the service and support their Order. families provide. Senator Reynolds. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr President. I'd like to just firstly acknowledge the Northern Territory Minister for Primary Industry and Resources, Paul Kirby, in the gallery. Here, here, here. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Pine. Payne. <laughs> Order. I refer to the Australian Bureau of Statistics Wage Price Index released on August 14 that shows wages growth continues to remain weak, growing at 0.6 per cent in the June quarter and 2.3 per cent over the year. Minister, can you confirm that this government has presided over the worst wages growth on record? The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Uh, Mr President, I thank Senator McCarthy for her question, although perhaps not for her introduction. I think it's fair to say that Mr Pine would never have been a senator. Mr President, uh, if I may uh, say uh, in response to uh, the senator's question, as I think the uh, leader of the government in the Senate, the Minister for Finance, has indicated, we've seen uh, wages growth uh, historically being relatively strong and stable throughout much of the 2000s, particularly uh, with pre-GFC through the year growth uh, in, uh, averaging over 3.5%. Uh, and that grew by 2.3 per cent through the year to the June quarter uh, 2019, which is up 1.9 per cent through to the year to the, from the June quarter 2017. But it does remain subdued by historical standards. The Finance Minister acknowledged that uh, in his earlier remarks uh, today, Mr President. Uh, we see average earning on a national accounts basis uh, from the, the AENA, another measure of, uh, of wages growth, which is calculated as total compensation of employees divided by total employees increased by the by 0.9 per cent in the June quarter 2019 to be two and a half per cent higher through the year but we do acknowledge uh, as I said before and as others have uh, in significant commentary uh, um, mr. president uh, that this is very subdued growth but it is uh, on a on upward trajectory Order. And that is senator Payne, and it is above please inflation resume your as seat. The senator what is on a point of on a point of order, Senator Watt? On, on relevance, con continuing the trend over the course of the day, the minister is not answering the question, which is simply asking her to confirm that the government has presided over the worst wages growth on record. Senator Watt, as I've stated before, as long as the minister is being directly relevant, and the minister was being directly relevant to the question, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question. Senator Payne. Senator Payne has concluded. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In response to recent data, ANZ economist Catherine Birch has told the ABC, and I quote, with EBA's standard practice being three-year agreements, new ones locking in lower outcomes point to slowing wage growth, end of quote. Is Ms. Birch correct that the record low wage growth under this government will get even worse? Senator Payne. Very much, Mr. President. I haven't seen those particular comments, but I do reinforce the uh, observations I made earlier, Mr. President, that wage increases are continuing to outpace increases in the in the cost of living, and importantly, we see living standards also continuing to increase, with real net disposable income per capita rising 1 per cent to be 2.7 per cent higher throughout the year. Uh, to support that wages uh, growth, the government is setting the right conditions for a strong economy and for jobs growth. In particular, a healthy labour market will help to drive wages growth for workers, and that's why our employment record is so critical. So, Since the co coalition came to government in September of 2013, over 1.43 million jobs have been created in this country. Let me compare that to the six years prior, Mr President, when unemployment increased by more Order. than two and a half. Senator Senator Payne, please resume your seat, Senator Payne. Senator Wong on a point of order. Direct relevance. Record low wage growth under the coalition. Will it get worse? 
I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question. Um, I was listening to the minister carefully, who had been speaking about wages growth. I consider that to be directly relevant. Senator Payne. So, Mr. President, in response, uh, in part at least, to the point of order, talking about employment, talking about jobs, talking about those aspects, is actually addressing the question of the uh, of the rate and the pace and the direction order. of wages Senator growth. Payne. Mr. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given Australians are facing stagnant wages, record household debt, surging energy prices, increasing rental and mortgage stress, and declining living standards, why won't this government act to reverse the worst wages growth Australians have seen? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And Senator McCarthy, I remind you again, the government's in. Uh, in commitments and achievements in relation to employment growth, just for starters. And we will continue to build on that proud record by creating, by creating a further 1.2 million jobs over the next order. five years. Yeah. We will also Payne, put Senator Wong is on her feet with a point of order. Senator Wong. One question. Why won't the government act to reverse the worst wages growth Australians uh, have the, seen? The minute I, I appreciate it's only 16 seconds. But at some point, it would be good if a minister in this government could actually address the economic questions we're asking. Senator Cormann, on the point of order. On the point of order, uh, Senator Payne um, actually directly answered that question when she pointed out that wages were growing above inflation, supplemented by tax cuts, increasing effective wages growth by even more. On the, on the point of order, Senator Cormann is correct. What is also relevant is that a question that has a substantial introduction, the minister is entitled to answer any part of that question. Senator Wong repeated the conclusion of the question. I consider Senator Payne to being directly relevant to the question. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I was about to say, Mr. President, it is also important to understand when we're talking about wages that we're also talking about putting more money in workers' pockets. And under the government's plans for lower taxes, workers will keep more of what they earn. In fact, they've already received some, Mr. President, leading to more choices and more opportunities. We've seen millions of taxpayers benefit from the $14 billion that's already flowed back into their pockets thanks to our tax cuts. And when that full plan is rolled out, and we saw them fighting tooth and nail opposite, Mr. President, tooth and nail against more money in workers' pockets, when that full, 14, when that full plan is rolled out, 94 per cent of Australians will pay a marginal tax rate of no more than 30 cents in the dollar. Order, Wage growth, Mr. Senator Mr. Payne, is time for the answer and they refuse has to acknowledge concluded. that. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please advise the Senate on the importance of stability and certainty in our migration policies and how the Morrison government is keeping Australia's borders secure? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan uh, for what is a very important question. Because, uh, Mr. President, as you well know, uh, on this side of the chamber, we understand the fundamental, the fundamental importance of protecting Australia's borders. We understand that the first priority of the Commonwealth government must be to ensure the security of the nation and, as such, the security of the people. It is a fact, Mr President, that if you cannot control your borders, you cannot govern the country. Since 2013, since we were elected to office, we have progressively cleaned up Labor's border protection disaster. We have progressively put in place policies that have had the following effect. They have stopped the boats. We have removed the children from detention. We have stopped the deaths at sea. And, Mr President, we have closed the detention centres. But, Mr President, what we also understand on this side of the chamber is that ensuring the integrity of Australia's borders is not easy. It involves tough decisions. It involves decisions that are necessary. Those decisions are necessary to ensure that we prevent those deaths at sea—1,200 deaths at sea that we know of under the previous government. Those decisions, those tough decisions, are necessary to ensure that we don't have to put children into detention. Mr. President, what we have seen over the last two weeks in particular, led by the Shadow Minister for Home Affairs,
Senator Keneally, backed up by the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Albanese, is that Labor have clearly marked their territory. They will backtrack when it comes to Order, protecting Cash. Australia's— Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of any threats to Australia's border protection initiatives? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mr. President, and again, thank you to Senator O'Sullivan uh, for the supplementary question. Uh, as we have made it consistently clear in these matters, if you blink, if you hesitate for less than a second, you send a very, very clear message to the people smugglers. You basically tell the people smugglers that Australia is reopened for business. It is not enough to put in place just the tough policies to stop the boats, to stop the deaths at sea, to get the children out of detention, to actually close the, uh, the detention centres. It is critical. Order. Senator Keneally. On relevance, the minister is talking about threats. Why isn't she talking about the 81,000 airport Keneally, arrivals please that have come your under seat. her government? Senator Cormann on the point of order? Uh, I, I, don't, I think that that was a frivolous non-point of order, and I think it should, should rule it out of order. Uh, thank you. For the, Senator Keneally knows better than that was not a point of order on direct relevance at all. This is not the time to make statements. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the threat has just articulated itself, and that is, of course, Senator Keneally, if ever she was elected to office as the Minister for Home Affairs. Senator Keneally does not understand the priority, the importance of securing Australia's borders. Order, Senator Cash. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. What are the consequences of abandoning bipartisanship of this important issue? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, one only has to cast one's mind back to the former Labor government in conjunction with the Australian Greens, whereby they dismantled the border protection policies of the former Howard government. And what did that result in, Mr. President? It resulted in chaos, complete, total, and utter chaos on our borders, which. Order, Senator Cormann. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Interjections are disorderly. Constant interjections are even more disorderly. I would ask you to call the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to order. For a Monday, the Chamber has been particularly disorderly. Senator Keneally, I would ask you to bite your tongue for a while. Senator Cash. Yeah. Well, Mr. President, in relation to Senator Keneally's interjections, Senator Keneally is just proving time and time again that she does not understand, in her capacity as the relevant Shadow Minister, the fundamental priority of a Commonwealth government, which is to ensure the security of the nation and, in turn, the security of the Australian people. You cannot blink, Mr President, on when it left. comes to border protection. Order. And Senator Keneally, time and time again, shows she won't just blink, she will actively actively dismantle the policies order. that this Senator government Cash. has put in. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Still waiting for the 81,000 Are there any motions to take note of answers? Sen Madam Deputy President. Senator Gallier. I rise to take note of the answers given to all questions asked by Labor senators. Thank you. And I think the performance from uh, the Leader of the Government in the Senate today and uh, his colleagues really goes to the heart of the concerns that Labor has around the government's management or lack of management of the economy. The economy is floundering on this government's watch. Uh, there is no doubt about it. They've been in office for six years, but the government doesn't have a plan to turn things around. And they got elected in May, but they obviously didn't come to that uh, election with any view of how to manage if they'd won the election. And the key economic data that's come out since the election has apparently nothing to them. There's nothing to see here. This is all expected. The economy is travelling well. The fact is that the key economic indicators aren't great. We've got economic growth at the lowest level since the GFC. The government is presiding over stagnating wages. There are 1.8 million Australians either looking for work or looking for more work. Household living standards have declined since 2013 and productivity is also going backwards. Household debt 
is high. It surged to record levels, increasing by $650 billion under the Liberals to 190 per cent of disposable income. Business investment is down since the Liberals came to office and is now the lowest level since the 1990s recession. With all of these economic indicators the way you are, you'd think that this government would have a plan or would be putting together a plan or an agenda for dealing with this. But all we get from the government is this is a test for Labor. Everything is a test for Labor. Well, we want uh, the government to focus on tests for the economy and to actually concentrate on the um, policies, the plans, the support that they can provide to the economy, because the economy matters. The economy, at the end of the day, and we can talk about all the statistics that we like, affects all of us. And when you've got uh, the economic indicators that we've had released since the May uh, election, I think any responsible government would be looking at it with concern and not just you know, crossing their fingers and hoping that the tax cuts which Labor supported and indeed which are tax cuts which would have been flowing in through the economy had Labor been elected uh, are going to do the job for everything. Um, because I think that is really placing everything into one um, into one area when we, it's clear that the problems and the yes the global challenges which we all acknowledge are there are having a much more significant effect. So the test um, that we are setting for the government is what are you going to do about the economy? We can't keep accepting the line that everything's going okay, that there's some challenges, but everything's going to shore up in the September um, once the September res quarter's results are in. We would say there are things that you should be doing now. There is action and steps you should be taking now, not just writing a letter to the states and hoping that they'll do something, but look at other um, levers available to the government. Uh, the Reserve Bank is doing what they can. Um, rather than pointing the finger at um, the private sector and urging business to, to take steps that they should be looking at, if they can, great. What is the government going to do? Bring forward uh, part of stage two. Uh, look at how you can bring forward infrastructure, particularly infrastructure in the regions where there aren't some of the supply constraints uh, that exist in the cities. Look, look at whether you can bring some of those shovel-ready projects um, forward into these forward estimates. We know that 70 per cent of the government's infrastructure program falls outside these forward estimates. We know that the uh, budget um, forecasts have changed, and they may have changed quite significantly if you look at the, um, the Treasurer's comments on the weekend. Bring forward the budget update so that all Australians can see exactly where we are and what the budget forecasts actually look like now. Um, look at um, responsibly reviewing Newstart, engage in that conversation that the country is having without you. Um, these are all things that could be being done if there was a government that was prepared to accept responsibility in how to support the economy over the next little while. It's not a test for Labor. Um, this is not about the Labor Party. It's not about what the Labor Party went to the election over. This is about what happens for the economy going forward and what, how that translates into people's households. What does it mean for jobs? What does it mean for wages? What does it mean for household income? What does it mean for consumer confidence? Um, what does it mean for household debt? What does it mean for savings? All of, all of the decisions the government should be taking at the moment should be all focused on how to strengthen the economy and not just pointing the finger at others like the Labor Party. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, Question Time today offers us the opportunity to engage in an interesting thought experiment. What would have happened if, on the 18th of May, instead of Scott Morrison and the Liberal National Party winning the election, in fact, oh, no. Bill Shorten and the Labor Party had have prevailed? Would they, having succeeded in an election oh, only a few that. months ago, right now be implementing the economic plan that they took to the election, or would they abandon it? In particular, would they be proceeding right now through this very chamber their plans for $387 billion of new and higher taxes on the Australian economy? Imagine the consequences for Australian families, workers and businesses if that was in fact the case. If, in the face of the global economic headwinds that Australia and the rest of the world confronts, the Labor Party was piling on top of that 
$387 billion of higher taxes. Helpfully, we have an insight into what the Labor Party might have done if they were successful at the election, and it comes in the form of an interview conducted this morning by Andrew Lee on Sky News. Uh, you might remember that prior to the election, Mr Lee was a key member of the, econ of the economic team of the Labor Party, although I don't believe he is any longer. Uh, the reporter, Annalise Nielsen, asked him uh, the very reasonable question, what would Labor do if they were in government today? Would they have been proceeding right now with their election plans? Now, after some dancing around the, the, uh, the question, uh, Mr Lee argued that what the Australian economy needed right now was higher government spending. Now, this could only be delivered in one of two ways. It could be delivered through their plan for higher taxes on the Australian economy, or it could be delivered with higher debt. Unfortunately, Mr Lee didn't share uh, with Sky News uh, viewers or, or Australians exactly uh, which side he fell down on. Was he in favour of Labor's higher taxes or more debt delivered by the Labor Party for future generations to pay? So, unfortunately, we are none the wiser as to which side of the debate uh, raging within the Labor Party at the moment that Mr Lee would fall on. Does he fall on the side of Wayne Swan, who says, full steam ahead, no problems here, nothing to see here, a great election policy platform that we took on the economy should be retained wholeheartedly? Or does he fall on the side of Mr Butler, who says, actually, guys, I think there might be good reason to review the policies that we took to the election? The question that the Labor Party is grappling with at the moment is, was it the economic policies that they took to the election, was it the social policies that they took to the election, or was it the leader that they took to the election that cost them the election? The disturbing thing for those on the opposite side of the chamber is the answer to that question may be all of the above. Uh, of course, as Senator Cormann outlined in question time today, uh, the government is very well aware of the uncertain global economic environment that we are operating in, and we have a strong economic plan that deals with that situation. Uh, it was outlined only a few months ago in the budget, and it was subsequently endorsed by the Australian people. So, unsurprisingly, we are not going to be following the Labor Party's economic advice here. We are not going to be adopting either the policies that they took to the election or the new policies that they now advocate in light of the election result uh, on the economy. We will be sticking to the strong economic plan that we outlined. And I think it is important to put in context Australia's economic performance. Uh, the national accounts show that the Australian economy has now completed its 28th year of unbroken economic growth. That is a world record and something which all Australians should be very proud of. Uh, it's a reminder that we do, in fact, have a remarkably resilient economy, and it is a repudiation of those who constantly seek to talk it down. In fact, in advance of the release of the most recent national accounts, uh, there were many commentators who said that Australia was going to have a negative quarter of economic growth, uh, and they were very quickly proven to be wrong. Real GDP grew by half a per cent for an annualised rate of 1.4 per cent, and in average year terms, real GDP, in fact, grew by 1.9 per cent through 2018-19. Uh, the government is very proud of the economic plan that it took to the election that has been endorsed by the Australian people. It includes immediate and meaningful personal income tax relief for the Australian people, which has been warmly received, judging by the record uh, tax returns that have been submitted to the ATO uh, and the billions of dollars uh, that have flowed into the uh, household uh, family budgets uh, around Australia. So, unfortunately, uh, we won't be adopting the Labor Party's plans in this instance. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. Those opposite are now in a third term of government. They have been in control of the nation's economy for six years. That is six long years for the Australians who are working longer and harder but just can't seem to get ahead. Like a bird trapped in an oil slick, the harder they work, the more they try, the more they have a go, to quote the Prime Minister, the worse their situation seems to become. The economy is floundering. It's all but ground to a standstill. Moribund is another description. The economy is growing at its slowest rate since the global financial crisis. Wages have flatlined. Almost two million Australians are looking for work or cannot get enough hours of work. The nation's productivity is going backwards, and this is having real-world effects on people's living standards. These are not abstract measures. Australians are hurting. And all the while, the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, 
the Minister for Finance, day in, day out, give their Pollyanna pronouncements that you've never had it so good. Tell that to Australians who are choosing between paying record electricity bills or not being able to buy their kids school essentials. These are the children, by the way, whom this government is leaving the legacy of having to pay down the debt that this government doubled. Remember, federal government debt is now more than half a trillion dollars. And the government, with the Greens political party, the party of I always like to think of all care and no responsibility. The government voted with them to remove the debt ceiling. And what was the consequence of that, Madam President, Madam Deputy President? The consequence was that federal government debt is now at more than half a trillion dollars. And this is the government that would tell you that they naturally occupy the Treasury benches. They are not good economic managers and have not been in, in their various terms of government. Tell that to the anxiety-ridden workers who are terrified about job security. Tell that to families who are struggling with the increasing cost of childcare. This is a government who may have a political plan, and we're seeing that with the re-prosecuting of legislation from the last term, but they don't have an economic plan. The Treasury is playing roulette with the livelihoods of the Australian people. He's so desperate to have a surplus recorded against his name that he's willing to put the whole economy, not to mention the aspirations of Australians, at risk in order to do so. God forbid there's a downturn in resource prices. And let's face it, with the Vale mine now going back online and increasing its production, what we're going to see is that the iron ore prices that have kept this government, uh, kept the, our economy going, are going to start dipping. So iron ore, so we've actually built our economy on the Brazilian Valley, which killed about 300, 300 people uh, earlier this year in Brazil. Um, iron ore, priced at $72 a tonne at the time of the lethal sludge slide, started set steadily increasing as Vale's production slipped. So it reached about $122 a tonne. It's since dipped to $91 a tonne, but this is still 65 per cent higher than the $55 a tonne forecast by Treasury for the current financial year. So when Vale comes back fully online, iron ore, is going, iron ore prices are going to start dipping and our economy will go backwards even more than it already has. The Reserve Bank Governor, Dr Philip Lowe, has already warned that they alone, the Reserve Bank alone, is not able to jumpstart the alien economy alone. They are not able to do it by themselves. The RBA has already cut interest rates to 1 per cent, many times lower than we experienced during the darkest depths of the global financial crisis. Dr Lowe has called on the government to intervene, a call that has been repeated by Labor. Bring forward it planned infrastructure spending, increase new start payments to some of the most vulnerable, stop attacking our industrial relations system that protects workers from exploitation and ensures that they are treated fairly. It is, after all, the unions who uncovered the mass exploitation of workers, um, particularly as we've seen uh, in the hospitality industry. If this government was serious about stimulating the economy and promoting economic growth, we on this side of the chamber would be the happiest. We are not in government, but we would be very happy if this government took responsibility that comes with sitting on the Treasury benches. But they have not. This is a government with, an, with no agenda and no plan for the country. They went to the election with the promise of Thank a tax you, cut. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd just like to acknowledge the family of Deputy Prime Minister Tim Fisher is here in the gallery. And if Tim was here, he would have understood the importance of not talking down our economy whilst understanding the significant impact that the drought is having on GDP and the devastation that's occurring across uh, much of western New South Wales and Victoria and affecting so many farmers. If, as just happened a few short months ago, Australians had gone to the polls electing a shortened government, we would have seen $387 billion of new taxes, and we know what impact that would have had on our economy. It certainly wouldn't have seen a continued positive 
uh, growth in outlook and resilience in the economy that we're seeing and business confidence improving with the re-election of the Morrison government. And it's only been just on the weekend that we've seen uh, I don't know, do we refer to him as Chairman Swan, President Swan come out in support of keeping all the tax cuts that Labor took to the last election, that it had nothing to do with the economic plan, the killing off of aspiration, the destruction of dreams that Australian families so often have that the Labor Party took to the last election, that it was all Bill's fault. Bill was so unpopular, that's why Labor lost. And, and, and Chairman Swan encourages the Labor Party to maintain and stay strong, tax and spend, stay strong to those socialist values. But these two weeks will show why the Morrison government was re-elected, while Australians opted to return a Liberals Nationals government as the stable and reliable choice. And in the face of many fa uh, challenges we're facing as a nation, in the face of global headwinds economically, in the, in the uh, challenges that we face across the world and internally, domestically, with issues like the drought. We'll see why Australians continue to stick with the Morrison government, who deliver a clear plan, deliver on the promises that we made versus a Labor Party that's conflicted, one that's tarnished by scandal, whether it's ICAC in New South Wales and the Audi bags full of cash, whether it's the Setka sit-in happening in Victoria at the moment, or Jackie Trout in Queensland and whatever department she sits over. And, and again, Tim would probably be quite interested in the Victoria and the uh, Queensland Rail as the uh, dispute goes on up there. But uh, Labor just doesn't seem to know what it stands for anymore, whose side it stands on. Is it the side of workers or the side of families? It's certainly not on the side of aspiration, and Australians saw that last time. And thankfully, most Australian voters took the advice of Chris Bowen when they decided to not vote for their policies. And we were, of course, very grateful for that. And the Australian economy continues to be grateful for that. So on the taxes and budget, on border protection, on union power and on work and welfare, Labor can't tell you what they believe or whose side they're on. There's no certainty and there's no consistency. But also these days you can't tell who's calling the shots in Labor. And we saw as the poll came out today, Albo continues to slide down the polls. Senator Hughes, um, I have given you a, a fair amount of leeway. You need to refer to those in the other place by their correct titles. Sorry, Thank the you. Leader of the Opposition, uh, Anthony Albanese, continues to fall down the, uh, in the polls. But we're getting on with the job and the proof's in our agenda. And you'll see that over the coming fortnight with the bills that we're going to bring forward ensuring multinationals are paying their fair share of tax, to stop the abuse of workers' entitlements by unions and employers, to prevent the misuse of welfare and helping more Australians get into jobs through the expansion of the cashless debit card and trialling mandatory drug testing for welfare recipients. We're going to protect farmers from activists as they illegally trespass on their land. We're going to prevent child exploitation with new mandatory sentencing laws for offenders and outlawing uncompetitive practices from big energy companies, delivering lower prices for Australian families. And that's the big difference between coalition and Labor, and that's why Australians made the right choice. The cashless debit card is particularly something that I'm keen to see enforced, having lived in a rural and regional area where we saw significant social economic issues and children who were suffering with uh, alcohol abuse and drug abuse within the community and well, high levels of welfare dependence, to make sure that we find the best ways of supporting people and families, that children receive the services and the access to the uh, materials that they need, that they're getting the proper food and access to school equipment that they require, as opposed to allowing uh, welfare funds to be spent on gambling or alcohol, that these funds are more appropriately spent on the family. We've also seen the statistics that have shown youth unemployment has dropped significantly in areas where the cashless debit card has been introduced, and we hope to see that continue into the future. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam, Anthony, uh, Madam Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the uh, answers to questions asked by Senator Wong and Senator Gallagher. And I suppose, uh, before I go to that point, uh, it's good to follow Senator Hughes and. Perhaps she should have lost another couple of pages of her notes and winged it a bit because she just certainly does better on her feet than reading pure old notes. But it appears to me that we ask a question about the economy to the Minister of Finance and the other appropriate minister, and the answer from the government is 
Were you elected, things would have been worse. Well, I hardly see that that's an answer to a question that's legitimately asked. It's a legitimate question asked not only by the Labor Party, but by every section of, uh, of economic commentary, is what should we be doing right now? And Senator Kitchen went to a very valid point. The disasters that have happened uh, to Vale have certainly impacted on the iron ore price, and we certainly are the world's largest iron ore exporter. And you know, uh, the contribution to GDP was 13% uh, in the year to the March, 13% uh, growth in the year to the March quarter. So we're certainly doing very well out of metallurgical coal, thermal coal, and iron ore, and rightly so. We've got the most efficient production systems in the world, and we've got access to very big markets. Our quality product is buoyant, and it is keeping the economy going. But when you look in this chamber and the type of legislation that comes through this chamber and you say, what is this government's agenda since its victory on uh, uh, May 19, and you go to, oh, I think we're going to improve the economy by bringing in some drug testing for some welfare recipients. I know, we'll do some more robo-debt. We'll do some more robo-debts. That'll, that'll uh, boost the economy. You know, these are things which you know, governments need to prudently do, but they're not going to bounce the economy. Now, the argument is that the tax cuts haven't washed into the economy yet, and that probably uh, is a 50-50 argument. Harvey Norman is saying they haven't seen it come into their accounts. So, but maybe people didn't take that tax cut, tax cut and go and buy a new TV. Maybe they put it aside because they know things are getting a bit tougher. Maybe their earnings are a bit flatter, and we do know that, that real wage growth is stagnant and declining. So maybe the, the boost that Senator Cormann and others are waiting for after the uh, $15 billion is uh, paid into the economy by the ATO, uh, maybe it's not coming back. Maybe people are saving that money. Maybe they're paying it out in higher electricity bills or higher school fees or higher transport costs, you know, all manner of things. We do know this, that young Australians are in danger of being the first generation in memory to have lower living standards than their parents' generation. Think about that. The Grattan Institute's generation gap, ensuring a fair go for young Australians' report, found that young Australians are in danger of being the first generation in memory to have lower living standards than their parents' generation. And it's not hard to look around to see young Australians who are not working one job and two jobs, but three jobs to make ends meet. You know, there is a massive underemployment, particularly for under 30s. And if you do get out into the suburbs and uh, places where young people talk and share their experiences, it's extremely difficult to find regular employment outside of labour hire companies. There's a lot of casual employment, uh, labour hire employment, and people are struggling to make ends meet. And they don't get 50, 55 hours of work. They get 15 to 20 hours of work, which doesn't sustain them, and then they have to go and look in other opportunities. So, I think it's a curious argument when we have, you know, three speakers on the other side when asked about what are you doing in terms of what looks like a flatlining economy, being bolstered by a buoyant uh, mineral sector. What are you doing? Are you looking in, you know, the looking glass down the road to make sure that we don't come into a crash, that we don't have a recession? which throws lots of people out of work. We have 750 jobs on the go at Virgin. You don't have to look around too far to know that there are testing times in the economy. But the answer from the government and the government senators over there is, oh, if you were in there, it would be a lot worse. Well, I've got to remind you, you're the government. You need to have policies in place that protect the Australian public, that you need to have far-sighted policies. You do need to look at the infrastructure pipeline. What is the point of having a surplus in a stagnant or declining economy? Because you're contributing to more stagnation and more decline. If you have a surplus in a growing economy, everybody can clap and cheer. But a surplus in a declining economy is not right. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. The question is, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye against. I believe the ayes have it. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I uh, rise to take note of an answer given by the Minister for Agriculture, uh, representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, uh, Senator McKenzie. 
Madam Deputy President, uh, right now there are people uh, in uh, southern Queensland, indeed in northern New South Wales, uh, whose lives have been uh, turned upside down. People who have lost their homes. Uh, many people have experienced uh, what is, uh, can only be described as uh, a, a severe trauma uh, in being exposed to unprecedented uh, wildfires that are ravaging parts of those states. Indeed, we know that uh, these bushfires have not only led to the loss of property, we know that livestock uh, has been lost and, and we know that uh, more of our precious biodiversity is being pushed closer to the edge of extinction. In the midst of all that, we see the brave and indeed uh, heroic actions of uh, emergency service workers uh, who are doing everything they can, can to mitigate against uh, the loss of life and property. One would think that, given uh, such a horrendous situation, that uh, this government would be doing everything it could uh, to ensure that we uh, prevent uh, further tragedies like this happening in the future. Yet, despite uh, the fact that uh, we know, not just from the science, but indeed from the emergency service workers themselves who have been imploring this government to act on climate change. When pressed on this, the Minister for Disaster and Emergency, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, when pressed on this this morning on Radio National, he was asked a very direct question about whether he believed that human-induced climate change was contributing to these fires. His response: It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant in the view of the minister charged with protecting the lives of people as to whether we're doing something that may indeed be contributing to these fires. It's irrelevant, according to the minister, that we could be burning fossil fuels in this country, contributing uh, to worsening uh, wildfires and extreme weather, putting the lives of emergency services personnel at risk and, indeed, putting the lives of ordinary Australians at risk. Of course, his comments are in direct contradiction of emergency service workers themselves. Indeed, we saw 23 emergency service chiefs from all states and territories come together and make it very clear that they expect governments to act on climate change or their jobs will be harder and they will be themselves at greater risk. The science is clear. Emergency services personnel are making their voices heard. We had the public health community, indeed the AMA and doctors, saying that it's time we acknowledge a climate emergency, and yet here we have a government committed, committed to increasing the use of fossil fuels when we know that coal is the single biggest contributor to climate change. Australia's pollution has never been higher than it is right now. We are pumping more heat-trapping gas into the atmosphere, into our oceans, than at any other time in human history. And of course, the government's plan to increase coal exports, to increase our gas exports. Indeed, gas exports are the biggest driver of this increasing pollution in our atmosphere and have wiped out all of the gains that we've seen as a result of the transition to renewable energy. Australia is now not just the biggest exporter of coal, but also the biggest exporter of LNG. And both parties are on a unity ticket here. Despite the fact that the International Energy Agency have said that the world can't have one single new fossil fuel project or we blow our carbon budget, what's been the response of government? Well, full steam ahead with your Dani Coleman. Joel Fitzgibbon last week spruiking the Narrabri coal seam gas project that farmers are dead opposed to because they know what it means for them, for their local communities. We've got Senator Canavan travelling the world trying to shore up declining markets for thermal coal. We know, we know why they're so wedded to the coal, oil and gas industry. It probably has something to do with those millions of dollars in donations flowing straight out of the profits from the coal, oil and gas industry and straight into the bank accounts of the Liberal, National and Labor parties. What we have in Australian politics right now is a duopoly doing the bidding of an industry that is fuelling dangerous climate change and that is putting at risk the lives of ordinary Australians right now who are being impacted by rising pollution and increasing bushfires. The message is clear. 
We need to transition our economy away from coal, oil and gas. We have to start addressing the causes of climate change if we're going to reduce the threats that ordinary Australians face each and every day. The question is the motion moved by Senator Di Natale be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.